Natalie. To know me is to love me. To love me is to know me. It's a fascinating concept, isn't it? It's one that we kind of know deep in our hearts, and yet we don't always fully express or recognize in the ways in which we communicate and connect with other people, right? Um, We want to be known. We want to be loved. We want to offer that love, and we want to know others, and yet sometimes we find ourselves so wrapped up in our own ways and in our own lives, we don't know how to know and love others the way God knows and loves us. And so part of our goal in a series like this, and certainly with this story from the woman at the well, is to discover how it is that God loves us, how it is that God knows us, and the ways in which that makes a tremendous difference in the ways we live our lives. I do want to say thanks and welcome to all who gather, particularly those who are new here, and certainly to our online community. We're always grateful for your presence and hope that you will be blessed just as you are a blessing to us in your presence with us. As we gather around this story... It's fascinating, really, when all is said and done, right? Because it captivates us in the way in which Christ knew this woman and loved her all at the same time in a very profound way. And so I want to encourage and invite you, uh, if you haven't already opened your app on the phone, uh, to do that or to pull out your Bibles that you've brought. We're going to be in John's Gospel in the fourth chapter. uh, As we continue, tell me a story. This is the second of several that come from John's Gospel during this season of Lent to remind us of the powerful ways that Christ does, in fact, know us. Beginning in verse 7, we claim this story this way. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Because, of course, that would never happen, right? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's a fascinating story, right? Jesus knows her. Jesus loves her. And Jesus desires for her to draw from the well of living water. He desires for her to encounter what she has no clue about just yet. But she will, in moments, have a phenomenal encounter uh, with the Holy It's a profound story that we all need to hear and we all need to experience, and yet we all often come to our own wells the same way this woman did. Jesus is already there, right? He's come to the well for a bit of rest. He's been in a good journey and uh, doing some good ministry, and he comes to the well for some rest. And, And this woman shows up, and she's a Samaritan. It's the noonday hour. He's a good male Jew. There ought be no conversation. That is the custom of the day. Between our cultural and ethnic differences, between our gender differences, between our faith claim differences, uh, there should be no interaction. But there is. And it's very purposeful. And it's very intentional. And in fact, it will give us very powerful ways to understand uh, why it does what it does for her and for us. Because it has a really profound impact on who we are to recognize that Christ knew her and loved her all the same. And so part of what we begin to glean is that when Jesus encounters this woman who has a different faith claim, a different cultural background, a a different lifestyle, a different understanding of everything uh, there is to know about the world, He loves her anyway, right? 
He is not concerned in the least with her lifestyle, though he knows all about it. He knows all about her five husbands. He knows all about the man she's living with that she's not married to right now. He knows all about her heritage. He knows all about her religious convictions. He knows everything that's wrong and right with her. He knows everything about her. And he loves her anyway. But far too often you and I get caught up in people's makeups, right? We get caught up in the way they look or their ethnicity or their cultural background or their religious claim and we want to know all about why they are that way because we just soon keep them at a distance. It's a part of our human condition because we don't necessarily always want to know how to get to know somebody because if we get to know them, we might actually like them. And if we get to like them, we might actually love them. But we'd rather have a fear of you because you're different so that I don't have to love you because if I don't love you, then I don't have to be with you. But Jesus, he paints another portrait. He gives a richer understanding of what it means to know and to love. Because that's what he does with this woman who is very different from him and any other person Uh, in Jesus' day, would have looked at her and gone the other way. Had no conversation, no interface, no interaction, no desire to know, no desire to love, no desire to have any kind of relationship. But Jesus, he does something different because he's that kind of guy. And he wants us to begin to do the same. So as she comes to get her water, they begin to have a conversation, right? They begin to have an interaction, even though it's awkward for both of them because it shouldn't be taking place. They begin to talk, and in their conversation, Jesus says, uh, in your notes there, Jesus turns the conversation from something physical, getting some water, to something spiritual, to get living water. And instantly the woman knows there's something different, but she can't quite grasp what that is and what that looks like. So the physical now becomes spiritual, and a part of what we recognize is that our own physical lives need to encounter something holy every once in a while, right? And so in Jesus' conversation with her, he begins to help her recognize that what she's come to get is not actually what she needs. And so there begins this dialogue that goes something like this in your notes. She has come to get water from the well, but Jesus has come to offer her life from the real source, right? the source of all living water, the source of all life. She's come to get water for her health. He's come to give her the source of all life. She's come to encounter something very practical. She's come out of practicality. I need water. I need to be able to bathe. I need to be able to drink. I need to be able to wash. I need to do... She's come out of practicality, but Jesus offers her spirituality. He offers her a relationship with the holy. He helps her to better understand that there's something more to life than just our human physical needs, right? Uh, She has come uh, in order to draw water for life, but Jesus has come to offer her water for her soul, the very essence of life, the very reason we exist and the way in which Jesus and God want to relate to us, right? She has come to draw water from a well that will cease to give water, but Jesus has come to offer living water that will never cease. It's very different, you see. And he's trying to help her begin to understand what that looks like and how important that will be. And a part of what takes shape in that conversation is that he tells her all about herself because he knows her. Because that's the reality of Jesus. He knows us. He knows our frailties. He knows our parched lives. He knows our broken relationships. He knows the problems we have. He knows the circumstances that bind up our hearts and our lives. He knows us and he loves us just as we are, just as we've come to whatever well we're drawing from on this any given day, Jesus loves us. And so just as Jesus knows her and loves her, Jesus knows and loves us. And the only way we can mature and grow spiritually is to seek to know and to love Jesus. And that's about a relationship. And it doesn't happen overnight. And it doesn't happen on a single occurrence, and it doesn't happen by just a a bit of wisdom every once in a while, but rather in an ongoing way, we begin to know Jesus. How do I know Jesus? I know Jesus because of the way I encounter Him in others, because of what I read of Him in Scripture, because of the way I might converse with Him in prayer, because of the way I encounter Him in worship, because of the way I might go into solitude or silence and spend time just with Him. I encounter, I know, and I love Jesus. 
because just like I want to spend time and interfacing and interaction with others, that's how I get to know and love somebody else, right? Because we are like this woman. We have this deep yearning and desire to encounter something that is deeper than mere water that gives physical life. We know that there's something about us that needs something greater than us. There's something in us that is not quite fully right. And so we need something beyond us. And so we have a need to be known and loved like this woman. In fact, as your notes indicate, we too, just like this woman, we thirst after God. We thirst for God. We thirst for a relationship. We may not be able to put words to it. We may not be able to fully grasp what does that mean? What does that look like? How do I make that happen? But we know in our hearts there's something missing and I want more. I've chased after the American dream. I've I've, I've been successful in all the sort of typical ways and yet my life somehow seems not full yet. We all thirst for God. Jesus would tell us in Matthew's gospel in the fifth chapter that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake. That's this, this yearning for knowing something that's richer than us and that we need that. And so we thirst. Well, here's the good news, sisters and brothers. Christ can fill us. Christ can fill us like no one else. Christ can fill us like nothing else. Christ can fill us with his living water. And that's what he conveys to the woman at the well, and that's what he tries to convey to you and me. And it's simply and solely because he knows us and he loves us as we are, just the way we are. You see, if Jesus didn't know her but didn't love her, he wouldn't have had that engaging conversation. If Jesus knew her but didn't love her, he would have told her to go away. She was, after all, a woman who'd been married five times, living with a guy she didn't even know right now. If he didn't love her, he'd have cared less about her. But he both knew her and all of her intricacies, and he loved her. It was a both and, not an either or. And that becomes our challenge in terms of how we begin to understand how we're supposed to live as followers of Jesus. Because in order to live as followers of Jesus, we've got to know and love Jesus so that we can know and love others. And that's what he's calling us to do. John would tell us in his gospel in the seventh chapter uh, when Jesus was at the festival of booths. And as he was at the festival of booths, he, he literally started to yell out to the folks, folks, if you are any of you are thirsty, come on. I got a well of living uh, water. Come and take a drink. He was saying to them, as he's saying to you and me, every once in a while we get thirsty. Spiritually thirsty. And we need that refreshment. And we need that filling. But there's some... There's a kind of a problem that exists. In fact, I would believe there's actually kind of two problems that um, we face, every one of us. Now, now some of you may think, I got, you know, four or five problems. I know I got 10 or 20 problems. But, But I believe we've got at least two problems that prohibit us from living fully into the refreshment that Jesus offers us, the life that is everlasting, ever loving, uh, eternal, and abundant that Jesus offers us. The first of those problems is this, and and hopefully you'll get this when I say it. Uh, The first problem is that we feel like we've got to get pre-washed before we come to Jesus. Pre-washed. You know, like when you go through those drive-through car washes and and they start spraying water on it because they want to loosen the dirt, right? And and we kind of take up the belief that that's somehow going to make a big difference that they spray water on our car before we go into the car wash. Friends, I'm here to suggest to you we we don't need to be pre-washed. Here's what I mean. We all feel as though, even if we're longtime believers in Jesus, or, or maybe we've just come to try to discover who He is, but we all feel as though, I can't know Jesus, or I can't come to church, or I can't relate to Jesus, or I can't talk to Jesus, unless I'm first made better, unless I'm first made whole, unless I first already have my poo together, unless my life is already ordered the way it ought to be. We have this incessant belief that somehow we need to be pre-washed. That's not so. Story after story after story in the Gospels and specifically in John's Gospel tell us that you don't need to be pre-washed, that Jesus loves you just as you are, that Jesus loves you as you are, that Jesus wants you in this relationship just as you are. 
We don't need to get our poo together. We don't need to get our lives together. We don't need to have everything in order before we have an encounter with Jesus. He wants us. He knows us just as we are. And He loves us. And it's in the loving and the knowing that He begins to shape us and help claim us for His purposes. But He can do that before we get the (laughs) pre-wash. King David wrote many of the Psalms. And one of the Psalms that David wrote uh, feels much like our own lives. It causes us to think that we might need this pre-wash. It's Psalm 69. And in Psalm 69, David talks, uses this great imagery about how life feels overwhelming, like he's like drowning in water and he's in a quagmire and it, it feels as though he's overwhelmed and the water's just sweeping over him. And he feels like there's nothing he can do to get better and there's nothing he can do to have a relationship with God and there's nothing that will work. Why even try? Every once in a while, that's us, isn't it? Every once in a while, we kind of go, I'm not good enough, Jesus. I, I don't deserve your love, Jesus. I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I can't earn this, Jesus, so why should I even try? Friends, I want to suggest to you that there are tens of thousands of people right around us in our community who believe that that's true who believe that they shouldn't come, who believe that they shouldn't encounter, who believe that they shouldn't know Jesus because they're not good enough. I'm convinced there's 30 or 40 of us in this room who believe that you need to be pre-washed before you have an encounter with Jesus. And I just want to say to all of us, you don't. He loves you as you are. And he wants you to know him as he already knows you. That's his gift. That's the blessing of what he wants to offer the woman and us. Let's get over that. Will you, will you join me in committing to getting over the need to get pre-washed? Okay? We got a second problem, though, and sometimes it gets in the way. The second problem is that we sometimes forget that we need refreshment. That is to say that we need to um, take a drink every once in a while from the fountain of life. We forget that this is a part of the faith journey, that this is a part of our relationship with Jesus. In other words, we get so wrapped up in our lives, we get so wrapped up in our family, in our work, and in our communities, in our neighborhoods, and doing good stuff, mind you. I mean, our families are good, and your work is good, and, and, and life is good. But sometimes we get so wrapped up in the doing of life that we think all we need is a glass of cold water, when in fact what we need is a wellspring of living water because we're parched and we're dry and our faith is dehydrated and our lives seem to be fading away and we don't even realize it. And so part of what we forget is there's something to this connection with knowing and loving Jesus just as He knows and loves us. And the only way to know and love Jesus is by engaging that relationship with Him with what we sometimes call spiritual practices. Worship, prayer, Scripture reading, study, silence, solitude, all, all of those practices. You know, It's like anything else we want to get better at, whether it's sports or dance or music or whatever. Anything we want to get better at, we've got to practice, right? And and so if indeed we want to get better at this faith thing, we want to know Jesus more just like He knows us, and we want to love Jesus more just like He loves us, we've got to to practice, right? And and so part of this is um, just as we thirst for God, one of the psalmists put it this way, and, and some of you know this psalm, Psalm 42 In Psalm 42, it talks about the deer, and just like the deer uh, craves streams of water, so we thirst for God. And the reality is every time we're thirsty for God, we need to quench that thirst in any number of ways that help us engage a relationship, right? That's what Jesus was doing with this woman. He was helping her to see not only that she was known by Him and that He loved her, but that He had a way forward for her. And in part, that way forward for her was to share the good news with others help tell others about what he had done and would continue to do for her. It's an amazing gift. And so um, now I'm going to take a break just here for a second because for those of you who um, have the written form, you don't have this next note. But how many of us have the app open and are working in the app this morning? Anybody? Yeah. So the app's a better thing this morning, so you've got this one. 
Uh, it's not in written form in your, in your notes. So here's one way we begin to recognize this need to engage this spiritual water that Jesus has for us. We need to know that spiritual vitality depends on a constant flow, constant flow of Christ's living water. This constant flow, it looks like... Um, praying as often as we can. It looks like studying Scripture as often as we can. It looks like worshiping as often as we can, rather than when it's convenient, when I make time for it, uh, when it'll work out my schedule, but rather this constant flow, because like anybody else that I love and care for and want a relationship with, it means I need to spend time with, right? And so a part of that means I need to engage that opportunity, getting a constant flow of the living water of Christ, knowing Him and making Him known and sharing that. John, the gospel writer, would say this uh, when he wrote uh, the book of Revelation. In, John, in Revelation chapter 7, John talked a little bit about how uh, Jesus is the Lamb of God and how indeed He offers uh, and guides people to the springs of living water. And so part of what we need to do is we need to go to that living water. We need to discover how it is we can connect with Jesus in whatever way works, right? Different forms of prayer, different forms of scripture reading, different ways to engage worship. Be because the, the other is also true. The next blank that you've got there. Um, in this spiritual journey, in this connection with Jesus, we cannot survive just by sipping every once in a while. Um, we need to guzzle. We need to dive deep into the pond. We need to seek out ways to just, just get right in there and slurp up the love of Jesus. Uh, in other words, um, we ought not go to prayer only when life has fallen down around us. It's not a bad time to go to prayer, but golly, let's not make that the only time we do that. Uh, let's not go to Scripture just when um, things are not working out. We need a little bit of wisdom. So, you know what, last, last straw here, I've tried this, I've tried that, I've tried that, I've tried all these things. Now maybe I'll just kind of check out what, what the Bible has to say. You know what, it's always good to go to Scripture, uh, but maybe we ought to go there a little more often. Maybe we ought to find ways that it can help us better understand how to love and how to encourage others. We can't just sip. Uh, and the third is also true. And that is to say that um, our spiritual health depends on constant rehydration, constantly going back to that well, constantly re reconnecting with what it is Jesus has for us. It's why during this season of Lent, we've been trying to encourage all of us to find a spiritual practice that helps us engage, right? Last week, we talked about uh, silence and solitude. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about uh, a practice of Scripture reading called Lectio Divina. Uh, there's a note down at the bottom of your uh, note page there and on the app that describes Lectio Divina. It's a, a, a powerful way to read Scripture where we select a text, and there are two texts for you listed there at the bottom of your page. And as you read it, you read it actually four times. The first time, just to, what does it say? I want to better understand it. Second time, I read it and I reflect. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, what can I do with this? What can I do about this? The third time I read it, uh, how can I respond? What, what does this call me to do? What am I going to do about this and with this? And then fourth time I read it, it's, and I'm just going to rest in this. I'm just going to let it resonate with my soul and I'm going to let it kind of speak to me. And, and you might be amazed at how this helps me to drink from the well of Christ's love and how it helps me to better understand His ways in my life. Now, if you don't have the app, you can go to the website, uh, tmumc.org slash Lent. If you go there, there will be various forms of spiritual practices that will help us to drink from this well. Because here's the ultimate goal that Jesus was trying to share with this woman. He knew that her life was dry. He, he knew that her life was parched. He knew that her love was dehydrated. He knew that she was just uh, as, as uh, dry as she could possibly be. All he wanted to do was to offer her a drink from the well of living water. My hunch is there's somebody in this room whose relationship is dehydrated, whose life is parched, whose ways seem so sandy dry that you don't even know a way forward. I want to encourage you to take a drink. 
I want to encourage us all to find one of those practices that could help connect us with the living God. Because as we get connected with the living God, we begin to know Jesus. And we begin to recognize that He knows us. And as He knows us, we begin to also recognize that He loves us. And as He loves us, we begin to recognize that we can love Him. And as we love Him, we begin to recognize that we can love others. And then, life is really full. It's like full to the brim. And it feels healthy and vital and everlasting. I wonder if we could allow Jesus to know us. And as He knows us, He will enable us to be loved and to love others more than ever before possible. Listen, as the words begin to speak of how He knows us and how He loves us.